Myositis ossificans. Heterotopic ossification. Wait for maturation to excise. Respect the soft tissue while doing hip surgeries, acetabular fractures, elbow surgeries, etc. Background. Myositis ossificans circumscripta is a solitary, non-progressive, benign ossifying lesion of soft tissues. A synonym for myositis ossificans is heterotopic ossification. There are several clinical subtypes of myositis ossificans. Myositis ossificans is also a recognized complication of paralysis that occurs below the level of a spinal cord injury. Background. A reactive process that is characterized by a well-circumscribed proliferation of fibroblasts, cartilage, and bone within muscle. Fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, FOP, is a rare subtype of heterotopic ossification involves mutation of the ACVR1 gene, active in A type I receptor gene, a BME type 1 receptor. Myositis ossificans is a benign process characterized by heterotopic ossification usually within large muscles. Its importance stems in large part from its ability to mimic more aggressive pathological processes. The patient is usually an athletic adolescent or young adult who presents with a lump in a muscle that has been evident for some weeks and may have been somewhat painful. A history of trauma can usually be elicited, but these traumatic incidents are, more often than not, trivial in nature. A radiograph taken soon after the onset of symptoms may not reveal any calcification, but within one to two weeks, a poorly defined area of opacification appears. Over the following weeks, the periphery of this shadow becomes increasingly well delineated from the surrounding soft tissue. Diagnostic problems in such cases occur when the lesion is biopsied in the early phase before peripheral maturation has occurred. Gross examination of a focus of myositis ossificans circumscripta that has been present for a month or two reveals a shell of bony tissue with a soft reddish-brown central area. The lesion is usually 2 to 5 cm in diameter and is adherent to the surrounding muscle. Fundamentally, myositis ossificans can be categorized into non-hereditary and hereditary types, with the latter being a distinct entity with a separate pathophysiology and treatment approach. The etiology of myositis ossificans is variable, however, clinical presentation generally is characterized by an ossifying soft tissue mass. Advanced cross-sectional imaging alone can be nonspecific and may appear to be similar to more sinister etiologies. Therefore, the evaluation of a suspicious soft tissue mass often necessitates multiple imaging modalities for accurate diagnosis. Most cases of myositis ossificans occur as a result of trauma, and thus, the primary demographic is young adults. Another group which is especially prone to myositis ossificans are paraplegics, usually without evidence of trauma. Pathophysiology The pathophysiology of MO formation is incompletely understood. It is believed to occur through inappropriate differentiation of fibroblasts into osteogenic cells. Canet al demonstrated that the cellular mechanism of heterotopic bone formation is the result of the dysregulation of local stem cells in response to tissue injury and subsequent inflammation. Recent studies have demonstrated that extraskeletal bone formation may be dependent on a process known as endothelial mesenchymal transition. Skeletal muscle injury induces a local inflammatory cascade, which leads to release of cytokines, bone morphogenetic protein 2 and minus 4 and transforming growth factor. These cytokines act on vascular endothelial cells of skeletal muscle and cause them to undergo endothelial mesenchymal transition. These endothelial-derived mesenchymal stem cells may differentiate into chondrocytes or osteoblasts when exposed to an inflammatory-rich environment. Chondrocytes will then undergo endochondral bone formation in extraskeletal tissue. Illustration of the cellular mechanism of extraskeletal bone formation in the response to muscle injury. Vascular endothelial cells undergo endothelial mesenchymal transition to make pluripotent mesenchymal stem cells capable of producing cartilage and bone. BMP equals bone morphogenetic protein, TGF equals transforming growth factor. Clinically, myositis ossificans progresses through parallel radiographic, clinical, and histopathologic stages. Table 1. Description of these stages varies slightly between authors, however, three overlapping stages of evolution are commonly described. Early, 
intermediate, and mature. The early stage occurs during the first four weeks following injury and is characterized by an inflammatory cascade that precedes ossification, therefore, calcifications are often not apparent radiographically during this period. As the lesion matures through the intermediate stage, four to eight weeks, calcification becomes apparent radiographically. The mature stage follows, characterized by pronounced peripheral bone formation. Lesion maturation continues during the following months, culminating in consolidation and, finally, regression. Clinical Presentation The presentation of myositis ossificans is variable. Most often, patients recall a specific injury or repetitive minor trauma. The classic scenario is pain and joint stiffness following blunt soft tissue trauma, e.g., a football player who suffers blunt trauma to the thigh, young active males are the most commonly affected. Clinical presentation. Similarly, repetitive minor trauma is commonly associated with the development of myositis ossificans. For example, horseback riders may develop myositis ossificans in the adductor muscle groups, a condition commonly known as rider's bone, and shooters may develop MO in the deltoid, commonly referred to as shooter's bone. Thus, the flexor muscles of the arm and extensor muscles of the thigh are the most commonly affected locations. However, an inciting event may not be initially disclosed. Clinical presentation. Subjectively, patients report muscle pain that persists longer than would be expected for a simple muscle strain or contusion. Pain is commonly the result of the lesion causing mechanical irritation of a surrounding bursa, tendon, or joint. However, Associated peresthesia, weakness, lymphedema, and venous thromboembolic disease have been reported when myositis ossificans compresses nearby neurovascular structures. Symptoms often abate as the lesion matures. Consequently, patients who present late may not have significant symptomatology. Garland reported that the most common initial sign is limited range of motion of an adjacent joint, with up to 20% of patients developing clinically significant functional limitations. Similarly, 10% of patients develop frank ankylosis. Edema is often present acutely, however, it may be difficult to identify when muscle injury occurs in large muscle groups. Decreased range of motion to the knee after injury has been correlated with the development of myositis ossificans in the thigh. Ryan et al. reported that patients with below 120 degrees of knee flexion had a greater risk of developing myositis ossificans. Patients may present atypically, especially when the history is not clear. It is possible that many of these patients suffered unnoticed minor muscle injury. Moreover, myositis ossificans has been reported to occur in all ages, including the very young, as young as one year of age, and in atypical locations, including hands, feet, ribs, head, and neck. Laboratory Testing Several authors have examined the utility of serum laboratory tests. Although no test is currently diagnostic, several associations have been identified. The serum alkaline phosphatase, SAP, level initially remains normal but after three weeks, in parallel with bone formation, becomes acutely elevated, especially in patients with clinically significant myositis ossificans. The SAP level cannot be used to determine the maturity or activity of a lesion and can remain normal even in active lesions. Acute phase reactants, including the C-reactive protein level, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and prostaglandin E2 serum level, are elevated during the initial stages of myositis ossificans. Imaging. Ultrasinography. MRI is the preferred modality in the evaluation of a soft tissue mass, but some patients may undergo ultrasinography as an initial diagnostic test. The principal value of ultrasinography is in differentiating between cystic and solid lesions. Interestingly, ultrasinography reportedly is able to detect the zonal pattern of MO, especially in the early stages, even before calcification is detected on CT. Thomas et al. demonstrated the role of ultrasinography in the early diagnosis of heterotopic bone formation.
They described three concentric zones, an outer hypoechoic zone that surrounds the lesion, a middle hyperechoic zone that corresponds to the calcifying rim, and a central hypoechoic zone that corresponds to the central fibroblastic stroma. The advantages of ultrasonography include the lack of radiation exposure, low cost, and potential usefulness in the early stages of myositis acificans development. However, its utility is dependent on the experience and skill of the operator, and ultrasonography is not recommended as the initial study for suspected myositis acificans. Myositis acificans is encountered incidentally on ultrasonography. Confirmation is recommended with CT or correlation with serial radiographs to confirm the classic zone of peripheral mature calcification. Radiography. Myositis ossificans can often be diagnosed with radiographs alone, especially in its mature phase when the patient's clinical presentation correlates. In its early stages, however, determining the diagnosis may be difficult because of the lack of bone formation. Initial plain radiographs of myositis ossificans the first two weeks are typically normal but occasionally demonstrate periosteal reaction, possibly because of associated subperiosteal hematoma and can be associated with adherence to the periosteum. Myositis ossificans may also mimic soft tissue sarcomas associated with calcifications, such as synovial sarcoma. The calcifications typically become more peripherally oriented and coarse in appearance. These calcifications mature during the next several weeks to produce a densely calcified peripherum with a lucent center, typically around 6 to 8 weeks. Mature lesions may have a lightly calcified center, this process can take up to six months or more. Mature lesions typically run in parallel with the long axis of the muscle. Once the lesion has matured, there is often a radiolucent cleft between the mass and adjacent bone, which might help to differentiate it from parosteal osteosarcoma. Mature lesions are sometimes adherent to the adjacent bone and differentiation from parosteal osteosarcoma may thus require CT or MRI. Bone scintigraphy. Bone scintigraphy is of little diagnostic value in the imaging workup of trauma-induced myositis ossificans, especially when presenting as an isolated soft tissue mass. However, a bone scan may be ordered when other inflammatory conditions, such as cellulitis, osteomyelitis, or thrombophlebitis, are considered. A bone scan will demonstrate increased uptake in injured muscle because of the presence of calcium salts and is the most sensitive imaging modality for detecting heterotopic bone formation in the very early stages. Bone scintigraphy. Several authors have found that three-phase bone scintigraphy is more useful in differentiating myositis ossificans from other inflammatory conditions compared with a standard bone scan, which generally includes only delayed images. Although serial bone scans have been suggested to aid in the timing of surgical intervention, the practical application of relying on bone scintigraphy to determine successful treatment is largely unfounded in this setting. Because increased uptake on a bone scan can be seen chronically in trauma-induced myositis ossificans, the authors have not found bone scans to be a reliable test for determining either the timing of surgical excision or for predicting the theoretic risk of recurrence. Computerized Tomography CT. CT is the best modality for delineating the zonal pattern of calcification and can be diagnostic before the characteristic calcification pattern becomes radiographically detectable. In the initial stages, CT demonstrates soft tissue swelling or a low attenuation soft tissue mass without associated calcifications. Typically the peripheral rim becomes increasingly calcified as it matures. The central lucent zone is typically isodense to adjacent muscle. However, if the peripheral zonal pattern is not evident, it may be difficult to diagnose myositis ossificans reliably by CT alone, necessitating additional imaging evaluation or follow-up. MRI is the best single modality for imaging soft tissue masses. An MRI for the evaluation of a soft tissue mass should be interpreted in conjunction with recent radiographs because calcifications may not be well demonstrated on MRI. Recently, Pap et al. discussed the utility of MRI for diagnosing soft tissue masses. They classified lesions as determinate or indeterminate based on imaging characteristics and clinical presentation.
A determinate lesion can be definitively diagnosed by means of history and physical examination combined with appropriate imaging modalities such as MRI. A lesion in a characteristic location, e.g., anterior femoral cortex, supports the diagnosis of myositis ossificans and is, therefore, also an important consideration. By comparison, indeterminate lesions, e.g., type of sarcoma, require biopsy for an accurate diagnosis. Because each physician's experience guides him or her in classifying lesions as determinate or indeterminate, a thorough history and physical examination cannot be understated, and a multidisciplinary team approach is useful for optimizing diagnostic accuracy and minimizing risks associated with further evaluation, including biopsy. Although myositis ossificans can often be diagnosed definitively by MRI, its appearance can vary depending on the histologic stage, therefore, other diagnostic considerations must be excluded, e.g., soft tissue sarcoma, abscess. In the acute phase, when hematoma is often present, myositis ossificans typically demonstrates a heterogeneous signal intensity on T1-weighted areas of high signal intensity that are representative of blood products. Fluid-weighted sequences may also be heterogeneous in appearance. MRI. T2-weighted hyperintensity suggests regions of granulation tissue, blood products, and edema. T2-weighted hypointensity may correspond to hemosiderin deposition or calcifications. Lack of lesion enhancement is characteristic when hematoma is present. Although intralesional enhancement has been reported in myositis ossificans, heterogeneous or solid enhancement should raise the suspicion of sarcoma. Furthermore, a rim of bright T1-weighted signal is often suggestive of peripheral methemoglobin, surrounding inflammatory edema may also be present. Gradient echo sequences can be used to investigate areas of hemosiderin deposition during this stage. The MRI appearance that follows the acute phase classically demonstrates a lesion that is iso-intense to slightly hypo-intense to skeletal muscle on T1-weighted sequences. Fluid-weighted sequences will appear hyperintense to surrounding muscle. At this stage, surrounding edema may or may not be present. If the zonal pattern of growth, characterized by peripheral low signal intensity, can be identified, this supports the diagnosis of MO and corresponds to a determinant lesion. However, in some instances, the lesion may be subtle and identified only by an alteration in fascial planes, thus stressing the importance of careful examination of the area in question. MRI. As lesions progress, a pattern of mature. Lamella bone becomes better defined and demonstrates low signal intensity on all sequences, and the surrounding edema has resolved. Mature lesions may have areas of internal fat, which correspond to marrow production in the heterotopic bone. If myositis ossificans is suspected on the basis of MRI, then CT and or radiographs are recommended to confirm the characteristic peripheral mature calcification. Histology Characteristic histology shows the zonal pattern periphery of the lesion. Mature trabeculae of lamella and woven bone. Calcification is seen on X-ray. Center of the lesion. Irregular mass of immature fibroblasts. Cartilage component may be present. No calcification seen on X-ray. No cellular atypia seen. Photomicrograph of a section through an intact specimen of myositis ossificans circumscript clearly shows the fibrous cellular center and the limiting the outer layer of more mature bone, H and D, times one obj. When myositis ossificans presents with a characteristic history and a clear zonal pattern on imaging, diagnosis is relatively straightforward. However, it is not uncommon for the appearance of myositis ossificans to be suggestive of other considerations, thereby making the diagnosis challenging. Nuvo et al. Review 23 patients with myositis ossificans that had a typical presentation. Of these 23 patients, 3 presented before the age of 10 years. 15 lesions were in unusual locations, including fingers and the chest wall. Only eight of their patients had a history of trauma. Two patients had constitutional symptoms that led to a presumptive diagnosis of infection. In eight of their patients, histology suggested a malignant diagnosis.
Thus, a malignancy may be suspected despite advanced cross-sectional imaging and biopsy. In the acute phase of myositis ossificans, the MRI appearance can simulate a soft tissue abscess. However, a soft tissue abscess classically demonstrates a uniform appearance with high signal intensity on T2 weighted sequences, low signal intensity on T1 weighted sequences, and peripheral enhancement on post contrast images. CT with intravenous contrast demonstrates a bright, rim enhancing fluid collection, often confirming the suspicion of abscess. It is also important to distinguish myositis ossificans from soft tissue sarcoma which can have very similar imaging and pathologic characteristics. A high level of suspicion is often salient to accurate diagnosis. A typical presentation, e.g., apparent hematoma lacking ecchymosis, intralesional post-contrast enhancement, and calcifications that lack the characteristic zonal pattern of peripheral ossifications may lead the clinician to favor sarcoma. For example, up to 58% of patients with synovial sarcoma have calcifications evident on diagnostic imaging and generally lack the peripheral rim of ossification that is seen with myositis ossificans. A more mature calcification pattern might also be confused with parosteal osteosarcoma on radiographs alone, figure 4, highlighting the importance of advanced cross-sectional imaging. Less commonly encountered considerations that may have soft tissue calcifications include reactive periostitis and, when associated with the surface of the bone, bizarre parosteal osteochondromatous proliferation, EA, nor a lesion. Occasionally, a chronic abscess will develop calcification and thickening of its outer wall, which may appear similar to myositis ossificans. Meloreistosis is a rare benign sclerotic bone dysplasia that follows a sclerotomal distribution and is known to have a myositis-like variant. The key to differentiate meloreistosis from MO is identification of the sclerotomal pattern, which is not characteristic of myositis ossificans. One rare but notable mimicker of myositis ossificans is a soft tissue recurrence of giant cell tumor of bone. Recurrent giant cell tumor of bone in the soft tissues will often have peripheral eggshell calcifications, which may appear identical to myositis ossicans. Treatment, non-operative. The goal of non-surgical treatment is to minimize symptoms and maximize function. Non-surgical treatment is often successful because myositis ossificans is self-limiting and often is a self-resolving process. Although well-designed studies are lacking, the observation that myositis ossificans is more common in patients with bleeding disorders supports the hypothesis that myositis ossificans is associated with hematoma formation, with or without concomitant periosteal injury. Therefore, the initial treatment of muscle injury to control the development of hematoma and maintain function is a reasonable approach. For the initial treatment of muscle injury, Jarvanen et al. Recommend a brief period of relative immobilization for three to seven days combined with rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Crutches may assist with resting the affected area and minimizing hematoma formation. Treatment, non-operative. Cryotherapy, 15 to 20 minutes of ice every 30 to 60 minutes, can decrease intramuscular blood flow by 50%. Aggressive physical therapy should be avoided in the very early stages to prevent exacerbation of symptoms. Assisted range of motion exercises, within a pain-free arc of motion, may begin as early as 48 to 72 hours. A gradual progressive exercise program begins with isometric training, followed by isotonic training, and finally isokinetic and dynamic exercises. Large fluctuant and symptomatic hematomas may benefit from aspiration. In one series, 42 of 42 football players at Vanderbilt University returned to full participation without loss of function after moderate to severe quadriceps contusion. The authors stressed the importance of early and persistent non-surgical treatment. In more mature lesions, active range of motion and resistive strengthening exercises are important to maintain and improve joint range of motion and function. Treatment, non-operative. The use of drugs in the prophylaxis of myositis ossificans after injury is limited and has largely been extrapolated from studies examining the development of heterotopic bone formation after pelvic trauma and hip surgery.
However, in a case report of traumatic myositis asificans developing in an athlete, two doses of pamidronate were associated with improvement in both the clinical and radiographic findings. Treatment, operative. Surgical excision is generally reserved for symptomatic lesions that have failed non-surgical treatment. The goal of surgery is to improve function and limit pain. Surgical indications include intractable pain resulting from mechanical irritation of nearby tendons, bursa, or joints, lesions that are causing compression of important neurovascular structures, and decreased range of motion that compromises activities of daily living. Marginal excision is adequate, but recurrence has been reported. Historically, surgical intervention has been delayed 6 to 18 months following injury because it was thought that surgery does not alter the maturation process and, therefore, premature surgery may predispose to recurrence. However, conclusive evidence supporting this approach is lacking. Treatment, operative. In fact, more recent research has challenged the risk of recurrence with early intervention. Ogilvy Harris and Fournizier reported on 26 patients with non-traumatic myositis asificans and suggested that early excision has minimal risk of recurrence. Similarly, Garland suggested that the decision when to excise should include the etiology of myositis asificans rather than be based solely on chronology. He suggested delaying surgery for six months following traumatic myositis asificans, one year after spinal cord injury, and months following head injury. Summary. Myositis asificans is a self-limiting, reactive, bone-forming process of soft tissues that occurs following injury. It may mimic malignancy early in its development, especially when it is not associated with a characteristic presentation and imaging findings. The pathophysiology is incompletely understood, however, it likely involves the inappropriate differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells into chondrocytes and osteoblasts in an inflammatory-rich environment. Diagnosis is often made with a thorough history, physical examination, and orthogonal radiographs. However, a variety of advanced imaging modalities may be useful depending on the stage of evolution. A biopsy is necessary to confirm the diagnosis for indeterminate lesions. Non-surgical treatment focuses on reducing symptoms and maximizing function. Surgical excision is reserved for lesions that have failed non-surgical treatment. The optimal timing of surgical excision is undetermined but has traditionally been felt to be best performed once a lesion has reached maturity. A multidisciplinary approach is helpful to accurately diagnose and optimize treatment. Bu slide gösterisinin hazırlanmasında ve ortopedik onkoloji bilgilerimin gelişmesinde katkıda bulunan ortopedi ve travmatoloji duayini Sayın Prof. Dr. Ahmet Turan Aydın'a teşekkürlerimi sunarım. I want to thank Professor Ahmet Turan Aydın who contributed my orthopedic oncology knowledge and changed my life. Thanks for watching my video. Please do not forget to subscribe to my non-profit education channel. Music